Discover solutions to issues that affect your family and professional life with practical information to help you get past life's adversities. Take a proactive approach to power up your life with Rosalie's expert resources. Americans nationwide are taking a proactive approach to planning their future and retirement. And millennials are no exception. According to the latest Merrill Edge report, 41% of millennials surveyed expect to retire when they hit a certain financial milestone or savings goal, compared to their older counterparts who generally plan to exit the workplace at a certain age or poor health prevents them from working. Here to discuss the highlights of this survey results and educate our viewer to plan, reassess, and rebalance to strengthen our retirement is financial expert Sharon Miller, a Merrill Edge executive. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning, Rosalie. Share with us what this latest report revealed about millennials' attitudes towards retirement. Well, the millennials are redefining the way we think about retirement. So as in your um, intro there, millennials are, are noticing what they need to have for a goal. So um, how much money do they need when they retire versus hitting a certain age or a career milestone? This report noted 53% of millennials view retirement as the start of something exciting. Does this mean this generation will redefine retirement? Absolutely. So instead of um, you know spending time with uh, at home um, and worrying about healthcare expenses, we find that millennials are looking to travel the world, start a new business, um, just just really go into their second act um, in retirement, uh, while they'll still keep contributing to um, to the workforce in the way that they define as as giving back to their communities. So this means like a whole new paradigm as far as retirement and lifestyle. That's exactly right. So um, again, depending on what type of lifestyle uh, you want in retirement will depend on how you need to start saving today. And in our Merrill Edge report, we found that 40% um, of millennials gave themselves a C or worse when it comes to how they are saving for their retirement. So for those of us who are planning for our retirement, it means more than babysitting our grandchildren and watching television and walking them to the park. What should we be doing now? Well, it's important that you have a plan um, and that starts with a budget. So make sure that you are um, sticking to your budget monthly and reassess often. The other thing that is really important is if you work for a company that has a 401k plan, be sure to contribute to that. Many employers offer matching contributions. And then I would also say that it's really, really important to seek help from a financial professional. Um, it's, it's hard to hold yourself accountable sometimes, so it's always a great idea to sit down with someone that can help you and, and assess your, your goals and your dreams and make sure you're on track. If we have a portfolio, we need to reevaluate it every so often and make sure that our money is in the right place at the right time. That's exactly right. Um, you want to make sure markets change, lifestyles change, and things change. So it's important that you continually reassess. So what small steps can we take now that will have a big impact in our future? Um, it's never too early to start saving. You want to make sure that you're putting away money on a monthly basis. Um, do it systematically so you just don't even think about it. Um, sit down with a, a financial professional. Make sure that you are having conversations about what's important to you. What are your life priorities? And they can help you stay on track. And then most important, make sure that you are setting money aside uh, for emergencies in case of a rainy day so that you don't have to tap into those retirement funds if something does come up, which we know there's always something unexpected. Sharon, tell us where our viewers can find more about this survey and retirement planning information. You can go to uh, MerrillEdge.com and we also have the information there on our spring report. It's got great tips and great information, not only about our millennials, but also all of America and how we can help you plan and save for retirement. 
Thank you, Sharon, for offering financial literacy tips to take a proactive approach and planning for our retirement. Thank you, Rosalie. May is National Moving Month, and according to the U.S. Census Bureau, more than 40 million people moved last year, with the majority moving between the beginning of May and Labor Day. Here to share expert tips to help you maximize profits or savings during the peak home selling and buying season is Scott McGilvery, the real estate expert, investor, and award-winning TV host seen on income properties, flipping the block, urban oasis, and more. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. Selling your home is so stressful, so creating curb appeal can help when spring is in full bloom. So why is it so many home sales and purchases happen in the spring? Well, I mean, the spring is a great time to get a fresh start, first of all. I think most people spend uh, the majority of the winter doing things inside, you know, focusing on work, the kids are in school, but all those transitions tend to happen in the summer, uh, meaning the kids finish school, so it's a good time for them to transition. Um, in some markets, not necessarily a lot of Florida markets, but the weather isn't fantastic in the winter to be moving. Um, so that drives a lot of folks to want to be able to close and start in a new home when there's no snow on the ground or when the weather's nice. Speaking of the Florida real estate market, how is it doing? I am a big fan of Florida. I am a Florida resident, actually. I'm, I have a home in Florida. I have a lot of investment properties in Florida. And the last few years have been fantastic in terms of not only the rental market, but the uh, home equity market, meaning the value of the properties that we have. Now, most of my properties are in Southwest Florida. Um, and uh, But most of Florida, almost all of the markets that we invest in in Florida have done extremely well, extremely well. We've seen uh, values uh, in double digits in some markets going up year over year. And uh, with all that activity out there, you want to be careful because it's one thing to buy and hold over a long period of time or to have a primary residence. But where a lot of people make the mistake is on the transaction costs, meaning you know, if you're always selling or you're always buying, you have to be very careful not to lose your profits or to lose your home equity in all the expenses that come with buying and selling a property. So where do we start when planning to sell our home? Well, the good news is that there's a bit of an evolution going on. I think everyone's well aware that um, the home buying or even the home selling process is now starting online. You can go online, um, you know, I go on owners.com, I have a look at all the other properties that are listed, I have a look at what things are selling, um, gives you a good idea of the activity that's going on in the market. But the, the flip side of that is that there are, you know, economies of scale to be had in this new model of listing online and using, for instance, um, one of their agents and avoiding some of the the brokerage fees that are associated with buying and selling real estate. You, know, you can pay up to 6% of the value of your home on the transaction alone, um, which you know, I think people are savvier now. They, they look online, they're like, I can do this, I can take the pictures, I can customize my own viewings. And if you're willing to do that, you know, it might be worth putting an extra five, ten, or fifteen thousand dollars in your pocket, uh, saving on that commission by managing some of the transaction yourself. And and actually in Florida, um, mainly so southern uh, portions and central portions of Florida, Owners.com is also offering a buyer's rebate and a seller's rebate. Meaning, if you purchase online through their portal you will get the buyer's rebate. A portion of that commission, 1.5% of the value of the home, will be rebated to you, which is unheard of. I mean, buying online and getting paid to do it is uh, <laughs> hopefully the future, but I mean, if they're gonna be doing it already, then that's something that people in Florida should be taking advantage of. And then on the flip side, if you're listing a property, you're gonna save on the commission of listing your property by using a flat fee service through owners.com and keeping that two to two and a half percent in your pocket. Because as we said before, it's the transaction costs that really hurt people when it comes to uh, purchasing and selling real estate. So what are some of the factors that help us determine how to price our home on the market? 
That's a fantastic question. If you're completely lost, um, you can obviously talk to one of the agents at owners.com and say, listen, I'm, I want to list my property. I'm just not sure where to start. Um, they'll have access to um, other comparables, which are properties that are similar that have sold in the area. They'll be able to give you a range of prices and a suggestion as to where you should start with your listing price. Um, if you feel confident in the value of your home, you can pick that price yourself. Remember, list price is a suggestion. If you overlist, however, you may not get a lot of action on your listing. If you underlist, which is also a technique, you may get a ton of action, but you may actually sell your property for less than it's worth. So having, you know, having somebody who's got the experience, um, someone who, who does this for a living, I mean, using owners.com for what they're good at is, is finding out what you should be listing it at and even using their agents to help negotiate if necessary. So what about buying a home? What are some tips to make sure you're choosing the right home, right neighborhood, and finding a good deal? I, I would say that most great deals are not found, they are created. Meaning that you're going to have to do your research online, um, you're going to have to look at properties that you're interested in, but then you may need to negotiate to create a good deal. And you can negotiate on price, you can negotiate on terms, closing day. Remember, price is just one of the factors in the negotiation of real estate. And some of the best deals I've ever had are on you know, being firm with the price that I want, but then being flexible on the terms that the seller wants. So I'm willing to close sooner, I'm willing to take the property as is, I'm willing to uh, you know, waive my conditions of financing and inspections. Those types of things allow you to get possibly the lower price that you want. Uh, but you better be confident in, in waiving all those conditions that you may need. So where can savvy buyers and sellers learn more online? Um, probably the most robust website for everything online in real estate would be owners.com. Um, it not only pulls from the MLS, it also pulls exclusive for sale by owner listings in, so you get everything on one platform. Uh, there's an opportunity to list and purchase through the platform, and there's incentive to do both. I mean, saving on those commissions, like I said, that penny saved may be the penny earned that makes the big difference between you profiting or losing money on your transaction. Thanks, Scott, for sharing tips to help us maximize our profits and savings during the peak home selling and buying season. Have a great one. You too. Mentoring opens doors for students and job seekers with disabilities. Open the door to an all-inclusive workplace. Watch the upcoming episodes of Disability Mentoring and get involved in your community. Be a mentor. Creating an all-inclusive lifestyle is what every parent strives for when settling in a new community. Mary Ellen Jones is a well-known parent advocate in South Florida who began her journey in advocacy many years ago when her daughter was diagnosed with autism. Mary Ellen is a nonstop volunteer who was appointed by former Governor Jeb Bush to the Florida Family Care Council, where she served as chair for six years. When we started with uh, Special Olympics, started coaching with uh, swimming, then I started coaching basketball and bowling and bocce and sailing and skiing. And she is a passionate coach who won the title of Special Olympics Coach of the Year. My daughter going to Nationals and getting two uh, gold medals and a silver medal. Aaron, who has no legs, got a blue, his first blue ribbon and nobody thought he could get anything and he didn't think he could get a blue ribbon and he got his first blue ribbon. It was amazing. Everybody was standing along the side of the pool yelling, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. And I found out that everything that a person needs to be a person in the community, you get in Special Olympics. You get to learn a skill. You get to dress properly. You get to be on time. You get to be with others. You get to be not a team. And you get to do things that you have to do to 
uh, be in a community. So it's, the Special Olympics is one of the most important things that a person with a disability can do. At a recent event, Mary Ellen brought together political figures, community leaders, and self-advocates, and families to help expand the voice of those with disabilities so they will be heard in their community. One of the presenters attending the event was Florida State Representative Bill Hager, who was excited to share with the audience Florida's commitment to increase funding of disability issues. Hager also introduced new legislation to safeguard those with autism. We are funding disability matters at the highest levels in the history of the state of Florida. We're committed to it, we'll continue to do so. I personally have a, a bill up on uh, autism, uh, really a, a, a related uh, issue in terms of uh, police conduct with respect to persons uh, with uh, autism spectrum uh, disorder. Uh, I bring you greetings as well from the state of Florida, from the legislature and Governor Scott. We stand with you, we stand for you, and uh, we, we respect the enormous uh, progress, the enormous effort of everybody here and all the people uh, uh, committed to uh, uh, optimizing the life of uh, all of us. Palm Beach County Supervisor of Elections, Susan Booker, offered tips and directives to encourage all persons with disabilities to vote so that their voice is heard. You probably got this sample ballot, and this sample ballot tells you all of the instructions that I'm talking about today. It also provides you a copy of the actual ballot that you should expect to receive when you go to vote, whether it's by mail or at early voting or actually in person on election day. And when you register to vote, you receive a voter information card and that card designates a location that you're assigned very close to your home to be able to vote on election day. It's your polling location. And your polling location on election day is open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And not only do we have paper ballots, but we also have a touch screen machine. And for those individuals who are impaired, we also have uh, some, some headphones, and we have a machine that reads you the ballot. And if you're sight impaired, then there's a round button, big brown button and a big square button. And we'll walk you through directions so that you too can vote without any assistance. Very important. The event included talent. Brandon Jackson shared his voice as a talented singer and clearly entertained the audience as he expressed how his dreams came true. For once in my life, I had someone who needs me, someone I needed so long. For once I'm afraid, I can't go where I need me, somehow I'll be strong. For once I can trust, but my heart is a dreamer, don't be for Archer shared how his self-advocacy experiences has paved the way to non-paid internships and fueled his dreams of attaining his dream job in communications at Kennedy Space Center. Pat is an active board member of the Florida Developmental Disability Council and staff videographer for this show. This is my seventh year of being mentored at Kennedy Space Center as their DMD day in October. And I've been, and two years ago, I've been having a, a unpaid internship events and doing brochures and putting together in, the, in their public affairs media department. Parents are very important in the film of a person with a disability to grow into a self-advocacy advocate because moms and dads and caregivers help us protect our voice in the community. And thank God for mothers like Rosalie Archer and Mary Ellen Jones to help their children with development of disabilities um, grow as older adults. And thank you all here today for this opportunity to share my experience. Advocacy is powerful. It impacts an individual's potential to achieve 
their personal goals. Mentoring opens doors for students and job seekers with disabilities. Open the door to an all-inclusive workplace. Watch the upcoming episodes of Disability Mentoring and get involved in your community. Be a mentor. Did you know many doctors and nurses clean their hands less than 50% of the time? Hands are one of the most common transmitters of germs. Not just germs that cause colds, but germs that become resistant to antibiotics and difficult, if not impossible, to treat. Poor hand hygiene contributes to the spread of infections in hospitals that affect 1 in 25 patients. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention launched the Clean Hands Count campaign. Here to discuss the importance of this campaign is infectious disease doctor and CDC expert, Dr. Arjun Serena Vassan. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Rosalie. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. So, doctor, tell us, why is the Clean Hands Count campaign so important for the public to recognize? Having clean hands is one of the most important things that we can do as healthcare providers to keep our patients safe while we're delivering healthcare. Whenever we're delivering healthcare, we want our patients to get better, and the last thing that we want is for them to get an infection from our hands that they didn't have when they came to see us. We know that having clean hands is crucially important, and it's not an overstatement to say that clean hands can actually save lives. Healthcare Associated Infections, or HAIS, known to doctors and nurses, are infections patients can get while receiving medical treatments in a healthcare facility. So how big a problem is hand hygiene compliance in healthcare settings? Compliance with hand hygiene is, is fundamentally important in all healthcare settings. It's important to emphasize that this is not something that's just important in the hospital or just important in a, in a doctor's office or a clinic. It's important everywhere that healthcare is being delivered. Now, it is one of the most important things that we can do and one of the most effective ways that we have to keep our patients safe. Unfortunately, we know that as healthcare providers, I'm a, a doctor, I see patients, uh, and all of us uh, don't clean our hands every time we're supposed to. In fact, there have been studies that have been done that show that sometimes we do it only half the time that we're supposed to. And that's not to say that we don't want to have clean hands. I think all of us, as, as doctors and nurses, we want to do everything we're supposed to do. We want to have clean hands. But you know, they've done studies showing that uh, as, a, as a doctor or as a very busy nurse, you might have to clean your hands 100 times in a day. And so it's easy to forget to do it. And that's why one of the things that we encourage patients to do is to be engaged with your care, to ask questions, help your healthcare team remember to have clean hands. And it's something we know that can be a little intimidating to do. I uh, tell people that I'm an infectious disease doctor. I work at the CDC. And sometimes it's a little intimidating even for me to ask my doctor or my kids' pediatricians. And so sometimes I encourage people, find a way that is, is comfortable for you, maybe that's not so threatening or confrontational. Uh, things like, I know I'm supposed to ask you uh, if you clean your hands. Or maybe even, hey, the, the CDC tells me I'm supposed to ask you to clean your hands. Find whatever way is comfortable for you. But it's, it's so important to be engaged 